Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. To my left or to my right, I am really excited to have a legendary studio drummer, Jim Keltner, here. Hi, Jim. Hi, Ken. <laughs> and um, <laughs> if you don't know who Jim is, which means you've been under a rock and you've never listened to rock music in your life, or even jazz, let me name you some of the records the artist Jim has worked with. And Jim, you can like go out and run around the block while I do this. It'll take that long. Right. <laughs> Jim has recorded with Tom Petty, Pink Floyd, the Traveling Wilburys, who he was a member of, Bob Dylan, I, I, you told me a great story about knocking on heaven's the door, Ry Cooter, Gaber Zabo, um, Leon Russell, Joe Cocker, Boz Skaggs, the Bee Gees, I didn't know that, uh, Fiona Apple, uh, four John Lennon albums, seven George Harrison records, four Ringo Starr records, Barbara Streisand, six Harry Nilsson records, Randy Newman records, a uh, uh, Charlie uh, Watts, Jim Keltner project, which I interviewed you in person here many years ago for Musician Magazine. Um, mm -hmm. I can't read my own handwriting. And uh, also you played on the Irishman soundtrack. But we are here to discuss Jim's work on this famous record. This is the new reissue of Steely Dan's Asia, which Jim played on Josie, the really fantastic, unusual track with Jim's trademark uh, percussive, unusual feel i love the great that great break in the middle da -da, da -da. it's just like perfect jim keltner um and jim has agreed to talk about this uh for my channel uh and i'm also uh using some of these quotes for the stereophile article i'm writing on asia so thanks for doing this jim sure yeah i can glad glad to, uh glad to be with you man but i'm sure people would like to know in general how did steely dan work did they play the track first did they play the song live how do they work when you walk in the studio? Uh, you know that that was uh, that was the, like uh, 1974, right? Or no, uh, 76, right? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, 76. And uh, so in those days, uh, uh, the the only way that I ever did any recording sessions was that we would be in a room and you would be with the musicians you were going to play with that day. And uh, the singer would be in a little uh, booth somewhere uh, close by and be singing. And uh, you would get down to business. And uh, in those days, uh, there was always a chart. Uh, huh. And it depended on the uh, artist, of course, uh, how complex the chart would be or or how it was written or whatever uh with steely dan uh those guys were uh they were they were kind of i always thought of them as kind of jazz musicians who who formed a, a rock group but i i didn't know I, I wasn't that aware of steely dan at that time only through friends other musical friends and uh and so I thought, I thought that uh, this is going to be fun, but it might be scary because uh, uh, I I had heard stories about uh, uh, Donald and Walter being real finicky. You know, they they weren't just uh, sort of rock guys uh, that didn't read music and and you know wrote songs and stuff, which is which is the way most huge and successful acts are you know uh look look at the the beatles my my beautiful friends the beatles you know those guys didn't read music um and uh the stones or any of those any of those bands, most of those bands but uh anyway the the point i'm making is that uh um there was a i think it was a two pager and uh, and it was all uh, it was it was mapped out, you know, um, uh, not it wasn't just a written out chart. It was it was mapped out properly and everything. And uh, what do you mean mapped out properly? Was on a yeah. staff sheet and stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, it was it was done. Uh, yeah, it was done commercially. You know, it, it wasn't oh. done by. Wow. I mean, it was it wasn't done like a, it wasn't a piece of paper with handwriting on. Oh, it. wow. Actually. It was actual notation, you know, like a real chart. And uh, wow. anyway, so the point is that uh, I uh, I looked at it, and in those days, my eyes were 
fantastic. I had the eyes of a kid. <laughs> How old were you when you did that session? Well, uh, if it was 76. Uh, About 30? 30, 34, I think. Right, right. And so, uh, you know, it, it, anyway, I I wasn't intimidated. I, I thought, I figured there wasn't a whole lot of uh, stuff. There were just a few things to pay attention to that were written out. And uh, otherwise, it was uh, it, it was a lot of just groove, you know, and uh, bars. Uh, and so I thought, okay, cool. I'll I'll be able to just listen to the music and and catch the 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 bits uh, as they go by. Uh, but as we started playing, I I noticed that uh, Fagan had come out into the room, and he was going around to each of the players and pointing out things, you know, like the guitar player, he wanted him to do this there, whatever, and and the keys and all. And uh, I was sitting next to uh, Chuck Rainey, you know, my one of my great heroes, you know, I couldn't believe I was in the room with him. And, and he was set up right next to my hi-hat, actually. Wow. That's the other thing about, about certain groups and at that certain time period uh they were um there wasn't a, a a big you know if you had a great uh producer like gary katz and you had a great engineer um and uh you didn't have to worry about leakage the leakage would be your friend you know it would be a great part of the music Oh yeah, you weren't and, in a booth. You were right out in the room. Yeah, we. I was in. Uh, I was in a, in a part of the room, and as I say, Chuck Rainey was was, you know, he could reach out and touch my hi hat. You know, he was that. Was close. that unusual back then, or were you usually in a booth? It was a. It was a, a bit unusual. Yeah, uh, huh. but I, I had gotten used to it because I had done so many different kinds of. It's the same as always throughout my career. I had just gone from, you know, I'd go from. Dolly Parton to Steely Dan and uh and you know just I was used to everything so like on the on the 5th October the 5th and wow. on October 6th I was a producer's workshop with Steely Dan so that was well, that like, was the name of the studio producer's workshop yeah where in LA was that producer's workshop was on Hollywood Boulevard yeah. Above sunset. So so Fagan was going around talking to everybody. Uh, you know, he would he we were playing and uh and and I would look up and he would be bent down talking to uh, Dean Parks or somebody and and uh uh so he stayed away from me and Chuck and so I thought okay cool we're we're just gonna he probably gonna leave us alone and we're just gonna groove and and uh but uh at one point he he came over to me and he said okay bar i i i almost remember the bar it was that it was it was a, it was an important session to me it was i i really wanted to do good because these guys were really you know they really uh demanded uh, you know to get to get it just the way they wanted it i i knew that from talking to friends so it was it was important so when he came over he said i remember he said open the hi-hat uh on the end of three or whatever on uh on in bar 55 or something like that and so i thought oh, okay so i penciled it in and then he said and over here and over there and so i had to do like i had to write it in several times and so I thought, oh shit, I'm I'm stuck to the chart now. I'm gonna have to really keep my nose in it. Did, did he and want to hear accents in different places, not always the same place? He wanted the it, no, it was very symmetrical, you know, musically symmetrical, the way he had uh had presented it to me, you know, open the hi hat here on uh and, and then there and then there and there, you know, like uh, probably eight bars later or something. Huh. It was a specific thing. And uh, you know, if you hear the record, you you hear it happening. But um, 
but the point I'm making is that I I had to I I wasn't able to kind of uh, sk uh, skate you know with the track I had to keep my nose in the track to see where I was. I remember that real well, and then I remember that um, the groove uh, was odd. It was the, the the tempo wasn't going to allow me to play something that I I thought I would be able to play when I, we first started running it down. So I. I had to make an adjustment there, and, and in making that adjustment, uh, I realized, okay, this will work. But then, and then we, you know, and then we cut the track, and and it was it was uh, given a thumbs up, you know. And, How many um, takes did you do? Uh, I have no idea. I I probably should have called Gary Katz. He would know. No, that that's cool. And um. But, was there a click back in those days, or were you just the click? Oh no, there was no click in those days. Uh, the, what what happened in those days was that people would uh, would come in and uh, and and play together, and they would play till they got the groove, till they till they found the the vibe. Really, it's the vibe. Everybody is professional enough to to get a groove going. Uh, it was the vibe and the feel that was the important thing. Uh, always in a record and uh i marvel sometimes at i mean i it, it's stuff that you took it for granted uh, you i would take for granted like uh listening to the radio and hearing uh, a, a song that just knocked me out like as soon as i finally got hooked into rock and roll and and pop music because i i really didn't like it i avoided it for uh, my most of my youth to the work. vibe on Josie is so great. That's such a great pocket and an gr amazing feel. The drums sound great. Um, it's just well, one what, of those classic it, tracks. Well, what I was going to say uh, is that uh, uh, later on, after we cut that track, uh, I talked to Chuck Rainey at some point. I saw Chuck at, at some place and we were talking and he was talking about, well, the only place that song grooves is <laughs> in the two bars. And I should have listened before we did this so I could tell you where it is exactly. But uh, uh, there's two bars at uh, within the uh, within the verses, maybe toward the end of the verses. Or, and uh, and Fagan was very explicit when he said. Uh, so play play a uh, double time in this little spot. So it was a chicka 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 chicka, and so so I, I had to do that, and and that was that was fine and everything. And but later, You're, were you doing alternating hands on the hi hat or just all right hand? Well, it was fast, so I had to go. I had to do uh, left and right, you know. Okay. Uh, but uh, but that was easy because you just come back with the back beat. Uh, but uh, but the thing is that. Uh, uh, Ray, Chuck told me he said, "Man, the only song, the only place that song grooves is those two bars each time it comes up." And I, I about that, but yeah. And I said, "Man, I know what you mean. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't. Uh, I, I didn't know how to how to uh, make it work. I so I had to do that hi hat." pattern you know which is uh just the uh sort of the uh not all fours but off on the on the back beats and awesome. and uh and so i i said i i felt like that's the only way i could do it you know and uh and then and then as the years went by and i mean like the years went by uh i grew to love that song the groove on that song yeah and I grew to understand that uh, uh, Fagan and and Walter really did know what they were doing. <laughs> I mean, they really they sussed that little song. Right? It was the first of all. It's the weird song on the album. You know, it's not the one that has a that's that sounds like um, you know, like Peg. But yeah, for so like for Josie. Uh, I grew to really love that. I'm uh, curious about the uh, 
what drum set were you playing? Were you just playing a studio set? Did you bring snare drum and cymbals? How did it work back then? Yeah, in those days, I had a little Ludwig, a little black Ludwig drum set. And that's I had... what we're hearing? Pardon me? And that's what we're hearing? Yeah, that's what you're hearing. But you're but the snare drum uh, was a uh, a drum that I had just got. And I don't know how I got it, but I ended up with a... Um, a black beauty, a, a real original black beauty worth a wow. lot of money. I didn't know anything about that in those days. All I knew was that I couldn't tune it for anything. It just sounded really crappy to me. Huh. And uh, I couldn't get it to be high. I couldn't get it to be low. It just didn't sound right to me. So I tapped on stuff and I found a, a clear plexiglass Ludwig, uh, uh, what they call it? super sensitive. Wow. And, yeah, and so oh. I, I loved it. It was, uh, you know, it was still, it, it was still near and dear to my heart, uh, the, the, the sounds of Elvin Jones and, and, uh, and uh, Philly Joe Jones, you know, those, those crisp, beautiful sounds, and, and Shelly Mann and, and the guys that I'd get to see play live all the time. Wow. Um, I, I love Chris' beautiful sound. And so I, I got it. I traded the drum across. It was a, it was, I think it was, uh, I used to know the price. I can't even remember now. I, it was really cheap anyway. And the first session that I had a chance to actually maybe use it on, I figured I could. I, I knew I couldn't use it on uh, with uh, Lanny or, or or a lot of the other projects that I was doing around that time because they would have me tune the drums uh, lower and and you know, we'd dampen them down a lot, a whole lot. Uh, but this drum, since it was Steely Dan, you know, I was thinking maybe those guys, maybe I could get away with it is kind of the way I was looking at it. Huh. I, I put it up. Was it a loud drum? No, well, you hear you when you hear the record, you you hear what it is. Clearly, wow. it's it's just it was a high pitched uh, snare drum, super sensitive. That's unusual. And it didn't have much splash or anything to it. It just was, and it was, and there was very minimal. There wasn't any uh, padding on it except for a little tiny piece of tape. What I was waiting for was the engineer. In this case, I, Bill Schnee, to say, uh, "Can you tune the drum down?" Or, I mean, he would have actually had that conversation with the producer Gary, and Gary would have had the the, uh, the uh, conversation with uh, uh, Walter and Don, and so they may have had that conversation. I will never know, huh. but you know about the snare drum being too high pitched. But I have a feeling uh, those guys liked it because it was not normal. That's that's the way I, I think of of uh, Steely Dan. You know, they, they uh, even though they made big hit records that sound normal, there was there was there was always something really abnormal about. And that's about what, and your drumming is abnormal in a way too. It's so unusual and perky and all the unusual accents. And then you overdubbed a symbol or something? Yeah, well, they that's uh, they asked me uh, later. I think it was to see. I think we we recorded. Uh, we we must have recorded that that the, that track in De in uh, October, early October, and then in December, uh, I think Gary called me. Uh, Gary Katz called and said, uh, can you come down to uh, Village and uh, Village Recorder down in uh, Santa Monica? And, uh, and because we want to uh, have you overdub something, can you bring something up? Uh, Donald wants you to bring something weird or whatever you have that's strange or whatever. And so, or no, you know what? I'm wrong about that. He said, we want you to do some uh, some kind of percussion overdub. And so, the the this is another one of those little funny things I had for 
for Christmas, uh, I think the year before, I had gotten a trash can lid signed and a little hole put in the middle so that it could be mounted on a cymbal stand and it was beat out. They took a ball peen hammer and they beat it out a little bit so that it would have the shape of a cymbal, but it, but it also had the trash can lid uh, 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 on the edges. But it was a joke for me. And they, that was kind of my reputation was that I liked crazy stuff. And so they, they uh, the, the great drummer, the great jazz drummer, John Dents, who played with Stan Getz and all guys, East, East Coast drummer, a uh, really good friend. Uh, he, one day at the professional drum shop with Bob Yeager, they were talking about me and laughing. And so they, so John brought this trash can in and said, let's give this to Keltner for, for Christmas. <laughs> they, they signed it and they did the whole thing. And, and, uh, and I remember really loving it. And, and I, and, and they put rivets in it, which didn't do anything because it's a big, heavy trash can, but it looked cool. Like they have the rivets in it. And, uh, so I was knocked out, you know, um, and, and I kept it around. I, I had it in my trunk. And the night that I went to do the uh, overdub session with uh, with uh, Steely's, uh, Donald asked me, "What have you got this weird? You got you got anything that's strange, kind of sounding or anything?" And I said, "Wow, you know what? I, I, let me go to my trunk. I got something I think you might like." And I brought it in, and they loved it. And so I played the overdub right then. And and there's a clip somewhere, somebody sent me not long ago. It's a clip of Donald and Walter uh, sitting at the board and raising the faders uh, on different parts of songs. And I guess they, I, I would imagine they did that on, on uh, all the songs or, or some of the songs, uh, but they did it on Josie for sure. And... Uh, and then when they uh, pulled up the fader, pushed up the fader for the overdub, uh, it really was cool. They, uh, you know, uh, I guess Sinead had put a bunch of really cool uh, uh, reverb on it, but but old school analog reverb back then. I, I wouldn't even, you know, all the engineers know, most of the drummers know all that stuff. I don't know Play, what- you know, Like the, play that goes and all that. Some kind of really cool, uh, uh, effect on it and it was beautiful and uh, because I didn't hear that when I did the overdub uh, I, ju I just did the overdub and we, we heard the groove and then that was it can you tell but, me what pattern you're playing because I can never pick it out from the hi-hat pattern in the set what are you playing on the on the trash can lid well it's just in that one spot you know yeah right and it's, and it's uh, it was just doubles just oh uh, really da 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 oh really yeah. yeah but it but with accents obviously i mean you know you that's the whole magic of of doubles you know period really is is how you accent where you accent and so forth making it swing yeah and and that uh that that track was so they were so creative with with the making of that of that song period really the the point is that the uh the the guys that played uh together in that room were just fantastic they they just you know they were the best of the best and, and, uh, and did you uh, have a guide vocal or were there no vocals to what you were playing no there there was the vocal we were playing to the vocal i i played to the vocal i always have played to the vocal of course the vocal, yeah uh, the, I, you know, the vocal, that's what, that's what I mean. I mean, everything about the way the structure of the song was, was put together. It was, it was incredible. It, just, it was so rhythmic and so beautiful. And that's what made my, that's what made the drums difficult to fit into because it was already grooving so good. Anyway, the way it worked out was good. You know, it, uh, everybody was happy. I was happy that, that, uh, Donald and, and, that Walter and, and Gary were happy with it. That's the whole thing for me. 
you know. Of course, of course. So how did you come up with that great fills near the end of the song? It, it rests and da 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 which is so perfect. It's an iconic fill. It, it was written. It was written out like that. Wow. Da 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 and but the tricky part is that it was uh, uh, a bar of uh, a bar of seven or a bar of five. I I I have to listen to. It. Yeah, I tried to count it in my head the other day, and I it didn't make sense just trying briefly. So it's an odd bar. Wow. Yeah, it's an odd bar, uh, which you know, which typical of uh, of guys like uh, Fagan and, and Walter, uh, and but. But just beautiful. And the thing is that uh, coming back in out of that fill wouldn't have worked unless you were playing with the, the best cats that that could do that. I mean, and that's and those guys in that room, you know, it just doesn't get any better than that. And and uh, so that's why that worked. All, all the players on it, you know, Chuck Rainey, man, playing bass. Dean Parks and and I think Larry Carlton and, and you know I can't even uh, I can't remember the the rest of the guys but all I all I remember is that it was just they were so good that it was hard to do anything wrong that's that's the key you know when you're making records if you can be in the presence of uh, people that play so good you can be taken care of yourself. You don't even almost have to worry about what you're doing. Uh, that That's what I've found over the years. Was uh, was Donald playing the Rhodes or was it someone else playing Rhodes? That's what I can't remember. It sounds like I, him. It's kind of heavy on the... Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it might have been him later. He might have overdubbed it or maybe he uh. was... I don't, I can't, in my mind's eye, I can't see him in the room playing. But on the other hand, he might have been, and that's the way he had access to the room, walking around. I'm curious, did they, uh, I interviewed, when I did, and I may have interviewed you for it, when I did the drummers of Steely Dan for uh, for Modern Drummer, I did Purdy and Jeff Baccaro and Ed Green, and I must have spoken to you for that thing. And Purdy told me that, that, um, Becker told him everything he was doing right, and Fagan told him everything he was doing wrong. Is yeah. That, does, does that ring true for you? Were they different in the, what, in the things they heard and wanted to hear back in their criticisms? No, you got to remember, I, I didn't have the history uh, with Seely Dan that uh, Bernard did, you know, or Jeffrey. And uh, uh, so I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't privy to any of those kinds of things. I, I just, uh, all I knew, I, I kind of got the feeling that Donald was the one that spoke and Walter was, was you know, in the room, you know, making, uh, you know, making comments probably between he and Gary and then Donald would. Uh, but I think Donald, I always think of Donald as as the guy, you know, I think he was. He was the main dude. It's funny in interviews, I've interviewed them like three times. Uh, Walter was the talkative one. Fagan did not want to be there. Yeah, Walter, that's the thing, isn't it? But in the studio, it was the opposite. Huh. Wow. I th I, my, that was my take. I, I I only played on one song with him, you know, so. Well, cool, man. I picked your brain. and I, I know you have to go. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks again, man, for talking about Asia. I really appreciate it, Jim. Yeah, Ken. Good luck with everything for you, man. And stay healthy, all right?